April of 2019, I was on a near field trip in eastern Pennsylvania where I met an interesting woman named Heather. While we were exploring the site, she began to talk about the land that she is the steward of a few towns away. When I heard the way she spoke about the land, I knew I had to get there. I knew it was going to be incredible. I made plans to come by in a couple of days' time. Also on the field trip, I met a man named Jeff, who I went exploring a few other sites in Pennsylvania with. He was also interested in seeing the land, so we both went together. The site featured in this video is located on private land, and I cannot reveal the location at the request of the landowner. What I can share is that the land is almost 6 square miles, 3,800 acres, that there are many stone features here that were on the original survey maps, and it is very unlikely that the surveyor would have built these features, especially since many of the original plots had very weird shapes. In this report, I'll only be showing you two different stone snakes, but this land is loaded with features and more reports will be released in the future covering them. So now let's dive into the land. This particular stone snake is located in a low wet land nearby a lake and surrounded on two sides by higher elevations. In the area are many other stone walls, most of them quite large, but they are very different in shape and design. They are much wider and much longer, form rectangular shapes, and some of them seem to have two different levels. Although this is the case, the stones found within the walls do not seem to be random stones plucked out of fields and dumped on the sides. They are uniform and stack very neatly and nicely, forming a very nice looking wall, leaving you to question whether the stone was imported by someone to make a wall too large for a simple farming wall, or whether the effort extended was due to tightly held cultural beliefs. Yeah. Yep. This one's got a little niche in the middle there. Yeah, what is what's that over there? It looks like it went up off that way. Yeah. Like a like an older wall. Yeah. The side's built up a bit, huh? Well, tomorrow yeah, muck boots for sure. That's where you just came from. That ridge. It's beautiful. Now check this out, is this a female or not? Look at the curves in her. Look at how right. beautiful. Wouldn't she be pregnant? With a, she would have an egg, right? I would think so. I would think absolutely so. And then look at another one, look how beautiful. Or there were a lot of trees here and they fell over and landed on it a lot. Knocked it over. I know, but this looks like it's been crumbled. No, no. Look at the yes. papers sticking straight up here on the poop. On the poop, how they stick straight up in here. They're they sideways. They're they placed sideways. Way. They come this way. They go. But they're placed sideways. Yes. They're supposed With the to whole be. wall. It comes out. It puffs. It's a puff. You'll find it on many of the other ones. Like puff. Uh -huh. What's on the other side? More stones. Yeah, see, hold on, before we get there, I would think that that down there was the head because of the face at the end. If this... The rattle. The rattlesnake. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's got the bigger stones here at the end. And then... And then there's like a little ball here. There's like a little ball here for the end of the rattle. Okay. You can clearly see the face in the other end of the, the wall. If there was a bigger head down here, like a bigger boulder, I would agree with what you said. 
All right, go ahead. Take eight. Right here we have a beautiful bend in this feature where there's a serpent and eel. But as you look up this way and go down, there's a pile of stones that go right to the very end. Yep. In that pile of stones, if you peek through without disturbing the rocks, you'll see it's a stone stacked well going down. But as you come up here, you look, put yourself right here and look down it and look at the beauty. Wow. And that well she was talking about, you can't see too much of it anyway, so we're not going to look too much at it, but there's a little pile of stones right there. Yeah, look at these. Wow. I wish I brought my muck boots. How far does this go? That's it, just a couple hundred feet? Maybe a hundred? You'll get you'll dry. Huh? You'll dry. I have other shoes for you. You can hike across. You want me to carry you? You want to take you back? <laughs> Come on, right here. Later on that day after we all returned to Heather's house, she started showing us some of her research. Aside from the long family history of the owners of the land going all the way back to Europe, and a very interesting story about fighting off a utility company to keep them from cutting across the land and tearing up many of these old stone features. She unrolled a poster on which an image had been printed that would forever change the way I understood how the Native Americans thought. You see, the Indians believed that there were three worlds. The underworld, where some spirits lived, where various types of rocks they used for tools are found, and even where water comes forth from springs. The earth, where the people lived, and the sky world, where the souls of the dead would go and where other various beings existed. Part of their beliefs when it came to making a ceremonial stone landscape was to mirror what was seen in the sky world, or to construct things that would be seen by the beings existing up above. An example of this would be the famous Nazca lines in Peru, South America. While you can see various lines very clearly on the ground, you may not fully understand what you're seeing. But with the perspective of viewing them from the sky, you can really understand the lines as a whole design. While you're out viewing a stone row or rows on the ground, you may wonder why it isn't straight, or why it meanders back and forth, or why it's even there in the first place because there doesn't appear to be any logical perspective on it. That is, until you view it from up above. So back to this mind-changing image printed on a poster. Heather rolled it out across her dining room table and my mind just exploded. There it was, a giant snake effigy clearly visible in the dense trees and through some cleared land on the top of a small mountain. But this was only part of it. I needed to see the rest of it. It took some help and a bit of research tracking the original down, but I was able to find it without too much trouble. Taken by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1939 as one in a series of many, once I located the original, it was easy to find the next one in the series, the one with the entire snake. So here it is, the stone row snake effigy in its entirety. They aren't too visible in the photo, but Heather says there's an eye and stone tongue coming out of the mouth too. And guess what? It isn't just one snake. There's actually another snake entwined with this one. Unfortunately, a recent construction has gone in where the snake is, and small parts of it have been destroyed though the majority of it is still there. But I think the most interesting thing about this snake effigy 
is that it follows the contours of the mountain. The ancient builders obviously had a knowledge of the layout of the land if they knew the shape of the mountain resembled a snake. At some point, someone made the decision to build the effigy there to forever mark the mountain as sacred. Thank you for watching this episode of Northeast's Historical Stone Sites Investigations and Explorations. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, join Nira at nira.org and join Nessie at nessie.com. Becoming a member of Nessie supports continued production of this series. You may also make one-time or recurring donations.